coming. Uh, we waited for as many people as possible to come in. The one hour presentation can start from now. Uh, we have this room hopefully beyond 12 because we were supposed to run this from 11 to 12. So I'm Naraka Gunawardena. This is my senior colleague, Mr. Bandhusila. We are science fiction fans. He, in addition, is also Sri Lanka's best known translator of science fiction. He has translated from English to Sinhala a uh, number of novels and short stories over the past 30, 40 years. He'll speak uh, into this presentation about the local, local uh, popular culture and how science fiction connects to that. But this is uh, the theme, how even though we are on the other side of the planet, from where the original Amazing Science magazines originated, started, did we in Sri Lanka also receive a little bit of that cultural influence? We are going to ask that question and try to answer it towards the end of our talk. But first, what is all this about? And first of all, what is science fiction? There are many different definitions and Different people, including the key writers of science fiction, have offered different interpretations. I'm not going to read out, but hopefully, as we go along, a lot of this is visually driven, as, as this is a very visually rich topic, amazing uh, science and other pulp science magazines, pulp science fiction magazines. This is one, one way of looking at it. Anything you dream is fiction, and anything that you accomplish is science. So there is, as I said at the opening, a very strong element of imagination. This is imagination and knowledge combined. Another great writer of both science fact and science fiction, Isaac Asimov, who wrote more than 500 books uh, in his time, also had uh, these views about science fiction. Science fiction, uh, some of you may have heard, is being frowned upon by the mainstream fiction writers and critics. They say that this is kind of substandard uh, literature, not exactly qualifying as proper literature in the same league as Shakespeare and others, uh, Tolstoy and others, but that debate is going on. Uh, science fiction writers, of course, believe that they are writing serious stuff. And why is it important comes from a public scientist who was inspired to take to science by science fiction he read as a kid. Carl Sagan, whom some of you have seen, on television, or at least heard of and read. He was a very strong defender of science fiction. He said to get children and young people interested in science, the best initial approach should be to get them interested in science fiction. Not just books, but also movies, comics, the whole range of products called science fiction or carrying science fiction. We begin by acknowledging two greats in this, in this genre of fiction. One is French, the other is English. I learned today that the more accurate way to say this name is Jules Verne, uh, but many of us have been calling him Jules Verne. Jules Verne lived mostly in the 19th century, at century of discovery and, and innovation and he wrote about things that were happening in his time as well as he wrote about things that could happen, many of which have come true. And H.G. Wells lived both in the 19th as well as well into the 20th century. He lived to see many of the early 
predictions and speculations come true. He actually lived through the First World War and the Second World War. He became a social critic and a historian of our times. And he had political views in addition to his science fiction. But again, one of his, my favorite quotation from H.G. Uh, e. Wells is this one. And I think in those few words he sums up what our civilization is all about. So it's a race between education and catastrophe. And for that education, in that race for education to win, imagination is very necessary. Not just knowledge, but imagination and knowledge together. What are stories for? It's a very difficult thing for a story to disseminate information. Those of you who have tried writing of any kind, and particularly fiction, will know how hard it is to write a good story. Or any kind. Crime or romance or science or anything. And this is the guideline that Arthur C. Clarke offers to, to all writers. Please don't try to disseminate information through stories. Instead, entertain. That's the primary function of fiction, of stories. Promoting a particular concept, scientific concept or technology, should happen incidentally as a byproduct, not as a main, main attempt. So that's the challenge for all science fiction writers, be informed by science and technology, but not too immersed in it. Now we come to the part of science fiction universe that inspired this exhibition downstairs, which is the pulp science fiction magazines. Called pulp because they were printed on very cheap paper, so that they could be sold very cheap, initially for 25 US cents, because they originated in the US. And the kind of pulp magazines, they were not limited to science fiction. In fact, the early pulp magazines were detective, crime, romance, adventure, exploration, all these all these trends were there in the different different pulp magazines, which started at the beginning of the 20th century, quickly gained popularity. Now we have to remember this was before television, so this was a mass medium of entertainment for people. So I'm going to show you a few minutes of a documentary made in 2010, looking back at the pulp era in in popular culture in the U.S. because that is that is what we are talking about and how that influenced science fiction writing and science fiction movies and a lot that came, not just in the US but, but elsewhere in the English speaking world. So let me, let me switch to the, the video and show you a first few minutes of it. Okay, so that's a very quick introduction to the times in which these, these uh, pulp magazines were a response. And uh, there was, somebody was saying, what's wrong with escapism? There is a famous line, I think it has come from uh, the writings of C.S. Lewis. The only people who are against escapism are who? Jailers. So, Escapism is what all these fiction and fantasy stories were about, and there is nothing wrong with that, particularly at times of great economic turmoil. And let me quickly introduce you to three main enduring science fiction pulp magazines. The first one is called Amazing Science, which has inspired this exhibition. Uh, one of the best known, and it was uh, launched uh, in 1926. And it was, in fact, the first magazine that was carrying exclusively all science fiction stories. Until then, there was a mix of other 
types of fiction along with science fiction in other pulp magazines. This was the first all science fiction magazine. And it gave a break to a number of writers who then went on to become fairly big time writers uh, who, who went on to write books. But originally, pulps are short stories. Ketikata. And the first issue of April 1926 had three well-known writers, three of the biggest names at that time, were featured in the first issue. By that time, Verne was already dead. He died in 1905, but they published one of his stories, Off on a Comet. Then they got a new story from H.G. Wells. And there was also Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote short, uh, short fiction, and including those some with science fiction, some with a uh, bit of science. So three, three well-known names along with others in the first issue. And there were line drawings inside. So the co covers were full color, very colorful. Inside it was all black and white with line drawings like these. So the covers were made colorful to attract buyers, potential customers, when they are displayed on the newsstands. So covers were among the most imaginative, and there were illustrators, artists who, who excelled in doing this sort of fantastic, imaginative, otherworldly, other timely illustrations. There are many, many, if you do a Google search for amazing science covers, you will see such a diverse range. You can get lost flowers in that. Second magazine, pulp science magazine, fiction magazine, was called Wonder Stories. Came out three years later. So the guy who started Amazing Stories, Hugo Gernsbeck, after three years, the company went bankrupt. Somebody else acquired the Amazing Science title, uh, Amazing Stories title. So he went and started another magazine with other investors. And that was called Wonder Stories. And it, in various forms, kept publishing until 1955. This was the first issue. And again, the the formula was the same, bright, flashy, not very politically correct front covers, considered perfectly acceptable at that time. And then inside black and white line drawings, short stories or serialized novels. Third significant magazine that came out was called Astounding Stories. Again, that's the first issue, which came out in 1930, January. And this was founded by a guy called Harry Bates, who was the editor for the first 25, 30 years. And again, uh, many writers had their first publication there, and then they are still in publication. That's interesting. They have, again, changed hands, ownership many times change the name also somewhat. Now it's called Analog Science Fiction and Fact. And they have a website and you can go and look at the archive, which is not comprehensive, but it, it gives the history of the magazine. In the first uh, issue of Astounding, the editor was giving the readers the shape of things to come in his magazine and writing in January 1930. This is an extract from the first editorial. Where he said that in, in his recent time, a number of things that were considered fantastic or astounding had become reality. So this was an attempt to, to look at what more is coming up, what more is possible. In other words, using imagination to explore the likely futures. The entire first issue, by the way, is online at that 
at that web location, at that URL. Somebody has, has it's not in scans, but in just the searchable font, uh, somebody has entered the entire first issue uh, for readers to, to look at online. Again, Astounding had many memorable covers. I picked up just a few. Right, so what in impact did this have, did these pulp science fiction magazines have on young readers of that time? I'll give you the experiences of two who have recalled it many years later when they themselves became accomplished writers. This was how Arthur C. Clarke looked back and remembered his first encounter. And I managed to, to find that particular issue's cover. So he, he used to, as a schoolboy, 1928. Now he was born in 1917, so in 1928 uh, he would have been about 11, closer to some of your age. And he used to browse at the local supermarket and found some of these magazines that had come over from the US. And that was his first encounter. And then he went on to collect these second-hand old issues and the rest is history. Here is an American writer who again was a young man at that time. And Frederick Paul and what he says again around the same time. Uh, how he came across one of these issues and got hooked permanently, initially as a reader and then as a writer himself. Now, these were, these were basically scattered young people, at that time mostly male, Believe it or not, the world's first science fiction convention was attended entirely by young men at that time. There were girls reading, but they didn't always network uh, at that time with the other readers. They were the usually the, the bookwormish kind and also technologically inclined, so they were, they were branded as nerds or geeks by their own friends and peers. So they read science fiction and because they were few and they were, they were isolated from others who read uh, mainstream fiction, they, they tried to network with like-minded young people elsewhere in their country, in other cities, towns, as well as in other countries. So in, in England, a few of them came together in Leeds in January 1937 just to share their experiences and compare notes and that looking back is the world's first science fiction convention. There is a um, uh, clerk among them. Can anyone spot who it might be? A very young 20 year old Arthur C. Clarke in this picture. Any guesses? Okay, it's the second one from left. He had a lot more hair at that time. And that's him uh, in the same, uh, at the same time and as, as a young man of 20. So this is the time when he himself, having started or having been inspired by that magazine, was beginning to write, beginning to send short contributions, critiquing other stories that were appearing in Pulse. And he didn't start publishing until a few years later because it, all the, the first few submissions were rejected, as often happens to writers. That is the first, uh, according to Carvin, who's giving the other talk and whose uh, pulp collection is on display at the exhibition. That's the first time that Clark actually found his stories into print. And that's the cover, and that's the, that's the story. I think in April, yeah, it's April 1946 in Astounding Stories. This particular issue, a copy of this issue is there in the, in the display. Another one he had the same year, 
And so this is what the inside pages look like with line drawings. Many years later, many decades later, he wrote a book looking back at his own interactions with the pulp science fiction editors and fellow readers and writers and that he called Astounding Days. And part of the inspiration for the cover art came from actual one Astounding Stories magazine front cover, which I managed to locate. So, so you can see that was around 1930 something and this came out in 1992. Originally, when Clark was uh, accepted, his stories were accepted, they were not given front page mention, because not all stories are given front page or cover page mention. First, he was a beginning, or a rather beginner, or new writer, but as he established himself, you can see that he used to get cover page mentions. By 1950s, he, the pulps were giving him prominent front page display, uh, of his name and illustrations inspired by his stories were beginning to appear on the covers. That's the experience of many, many science fiction writers. So originally they will, they will appear as newcomers and then they will become more prominent, they'll get more front page cover treatment and then they'll go on to publish books and, and become established published book writers. So that was a trajectory for Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, uh, Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, and many, many, many others. These were the launch pads from where they, they, their careers took off. One important story went very far, one of Clarke's short stories. Originally appearing in 1951, but written in the summer of 1948 was a story called The Sentinel of Eternity. It was a story that was submitted to a BBC short story competition, didn't win, and then he submitted it to one of the pulp science fiction magazines called Ten Story Fantasy, a magazine that didn't last too long. But Sentinel of Eternity appeared in its one of the few issues it published, and, and then years later, when science fiction, when uh, film director Stanley Kubrick was looking for an idea to, to adapt into a movie, this became the original story that evolved into 2001 A Space Odyssey. That movie was made between 1964 and 1968, released in the uh, spring of 1968 and is co still considered one of the finest movies made and it often figures in the 100 best films in the first century of the cinema. Not just science fiction films but of all films and certainly it's a classic science fiction film and this was uh, part of the production team. Kubrick is uh, standing uh, next to Clark, and the guy in the in the tennis clothes uh, just came actually having played tennis, was the science and technology advisor to the whole production. His name was Frederick Ordway, and he just died earlier this week. He was, he was talking about the making of 2001, all these years giving various interviews, talks, and this was last year when he held up that particular issue of the magazine where the story first appeared, and then what happened? Uh, he was a space scientist who took a strong, a strong interest in imagination and, and visionary activities. He wrote books himself, but his best known contribution is as the science and technology advisor or consultant to Kubrick and Clark. Now we come to Sri Lanka and ask the question, what influence might popular pop culture science fiction magazines have had on Sri Lanka? Uh, 
Is it possible? And if so, how? So this is the well-known, well-loved image. The first time our island and subcontinent were photographed from space, from one of the early US manned space missions, Gemini 11. And today it remains one of the one of the better images. Since then, the space shuttle has taken uh, photos, but I I somehow like this 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 image. Anyways, what I what I feel, and this is just a this is just a personal point of view, is that while we didn't have the same kind of pulp fiction magazines coming up because our market was very different, we were much smaller. It influenced the covers of pulp science magazines, pulp fiction magazines influenced our early illustrators. For example, of Chitrakatas, the comics. The first of which came out in a newspaper in 1951 in Lanka paper. And then it was emulated by other, other publishing houses and by the middle of the 50s all the leading publishing houses were carrying Chitrakata in their newspapers. And then another 10-15 years later, all Chitrakata papers like Saputa were also launched. So this was one of the pioneers, G. S. Fernando. And he was best known as a political cartoonist in the times of Ceylon, but he also drew comics, titrakatas. And his style was very clearly influenced by, by the early pulp covers. This was the first singular titrakata ever, later published as a book. And so this is, you can see some of the similarities. Another, another illustrator, also in the same generation as uh, G.S. Fernando, was Social Premara. And he drew a number of very popular Chitrakatas that appeared originally in Times Group newspapers and later came out as, as books. So I'll show you some of the covers. I have collected some which came out recently as new editions because I'm a fan of comics. So as you can see, Susil Premaratna pushed the limits. He put, he put this kind of scantily clad ladies on the cover. There were bare-breasted women inside in some of his Chitrakatas. And at that time, in the 1950s and 60s, in mainstream Sri Lankan newspapers. This was an all-time favorite. Ram Dupada was an adventure, fantastic tale that ran for about 200, uh, 150 or 200 weeks, later came out as, as a book. And this, again, was one of uh, Premaratna's creations. OK, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Bandhusil now, who will explore this a little further in terms of writing. And his takeoff point is this underappreciated writer called Demon Ananda who, who tried the Sri Lankan equivalent of pulp fiction. Very cheap thrillers and detective stories that were sold in the 1960s, 70s uh, and altogether more than a thousand titles that, that this one man wrote. And all the mainstream established writers ridiculed him, condemned him, didn't even acknowledge him as a writer. And so that's the kind of treatment he received. Uh, over to you, Mr. Bansi. Now the question Nalaka asked was, did the did the pulp fiction American pulp fiction had an influence in Sri Lanka. I think yes, it had, but not immediately because pulp fiction appeared in US in the 30s. But uh, 
our equivalent, which we can call Pulp Fiction. It can be identified similar to that. Did not come in magazines, because the American thing was Pulp Fiction magazines. But uh, Demon Anand published books, but they were small books. And were, you know, sold for very 60 cents. I think the most expensive book cost only one rupee at that time. Right? Most of were 60, 75 cents like that. So it was very equivalent to, very, very similar to the Pulp Fiction of uh, USA. Very uh, cheap, which everybody can buy. And uh, I can remember as then I was a student. And uh, the, you know, they were very popular and everybody could, could buy. And of course, our parents did not want us to read them. <laughs> That's a different story, but, the, but they were popular. And uh, he wrote on so many, I mean, not on one, only on one, and he wrote on some were uh, detectives, some were horror stories, some were ghost stories, all type of things, and some were romance. And he was called Maharaka Katha Chakravarti. <laughs> he was known as that, because he wrote uh, all that was in signal fiction was considered as Maharaka Katha. Something to do with death and all that. So it was called Maharaka Katha Chakravarti. And uh, he in fact wrote, I don't think anybody can equal this thing, thousand and nine books. Right, even now, the, the one of the best we know is uh, Asimo, who has written 500 books. But uh, Divan Anand said all of them and did 1009 books in, uh, in, in his lifetime. But as now, unfortunately, he was not considered a serious writer by the literary establishment in this country. His first book was called Gantara Holman. It was a ghost story. And uh, then, of course, he wrote so many things like with me, Maru Javarama, Pau Paladima, Rival Rai Mamai, Brigadium. His last book, the 1009 book, was called Sadasulaga, which was uh, based on the, uh, more, more or less on the 88-89 troubles, based on that. And most of them were priced, I, as I told you earlier, from 60 cents to 75 cents to 1 rupee. So that every could, anybody could buy it. And he also wrote uh, 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 science fiction. And this is the only one. Actually, it's not that. He, he translated. I mean, you may all have heard about uh, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, and he translated this one, and it came as Frankenstein ke Palgani. And uh, this is the only, only, only science fiction that he attempted at. Rest were detective and horror stories. Now, science fiction, I think, uh, from Demon Anandas time after that, uh, there were the, the science fiction in Sri Lanka, of course, is mostly in form of translation. <coughs> It, I mean, the, 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 it, it came into the Sri Lankan literary scene in, in the form of translations and mostly of uh, Arthur Clarke because Arthur Clarke happened to live here and he was popular and his books were selling well. And uh, some of them were translated by B and then there are others also who did very good translations of them. And some of them, you may have seen this, these uh, 2009 is famous uh, uh, and then that series, 10, 2061, 2001, all those are now available in Sinhala. This is uh, this Randu Drama. Fountain of Paradise, and this is, uh, I don't know whether you are ready, this is one of the books that Arthur Clarke wrote based on Sri Lanka. It's, uh, most of his books are not based on Sri Lanka, but this is one of them. Uh, he based on an island which is more or less equal to Sri Lanka and he weaves around the legends of Sigiriya and uh, Sri Pada and uh, it's a very nice story as uh, since we know the Sri Lankan history it's about it's uh, around that 
and you might say that he also kind of anticipated the militant Buddhism arising in Sri Lanka. Yes, yes, yes. yes. What is happening today? <laughs> I think he foresaw a long time ago. I think this was first published in uh, eight, eight seventy eight. Right? He saw the Buddhism will come militant in time to come. <laughs> And of course, at that time, in his story, the Mahanayaka is a foreigner. The, the Mahanayaka of the, the uh, who is at the, the Mahanihara is a foreigner. This is uh, one of the uh, very good books that Arthur Clarke wrote, Deep Range, and was translated by the famous writer Cyril C. Perra, who did a uh, lot of, you know, mainstream literary translations, uh, like Tolstoy and all that, and he translated this into Sinhala, and it's still available. Then there are other new writers who have done some of those. This Aung San is the last book that uh, Arthur Clarke wrote, The Final Theorem. Then there are, in addition to Clarke, there are uh, people who have attempted writing uh, other other uh, writers like uh, Asimov. Asimov is one of the very famous writers, and one of his books also has been translated into Sinhala. I think that's all I have to say. I think we will have a discussion. Of I have a little wrapping up, and then we'll yes. So we come back to the, the overall science fiction field and try to wrap up asking this question, what use is science fiction? I mean, why should we bother? Because in the 19th century and early 20th century, a lot of things were still being discovered, a lot of inventions and, and technologies were coming up. Uh, so the needs of society were a little different. Do we still need science fiction? Well, this is, uh, let's answer from perspectives of some mainstream writers. Ray Bradbury has often said that science fiction writers like him are not trying to predict the future, but are in fact trying to warn about undesirable futures. And, and so that early warning function about undesirable futures is a very key function science fiction continues to play even today. One of his best known stories is Fahrenheit 451 and it happens at a time when books and libraries are under siege and reading books is considered a crime and how uh, things, you know, it's kind of dystopian. Things have gone bad, wrong. And, and this is what he said, uh, looking back on this landmark novel many years later, uh, and also taking into account how few people read books these days anyway. This is what he had to say later. What good is science fiction? Here is the view of another, another guy. Uh, who has been documenting, who was a writer himself, but who also documented. He's written a definitive history of the pulp fiction era uh, that we talked about. He thinks that it's more for the imagination value rather than the predictive value of science fiction. Predictions, some were right, others were wrong when you look back at the last century or so of science fiction. But definitely the greater societal value is in how these stories and these writers inspired several generations of young people. Some of who went on to become scientists, engineers, astronauts, researchers, you name it. Many, many, many. And NASA knows this very well. I mean, NASA routinely surveys their own staff technical, professional staff, and a very significant number of them attribute science, uh, their, their initial uh, interest in science to science fiction. 
Then Arthur Clarke offered this advice. I'm not sure how many politicians would, would want to actually take this, but it's not just in English. Where certain concepts have been explained, suggested, proposed by science fiction writers. Looking for ideas that might be used as research leads. So that, that study looked at, uh, these were the headings of the chapters, so it looked at within the broad area of what is needed for space exploration, they looked at not just the propulsion and space colonies, but also look at looking at energy and power, computers and communications, uh, and other, other technologies that can, use, that can be used to set up future space space uh, stations as well as at some point future space colonies. And one, one uh, very relevant quotation that Mr. Vandusil located for our talk is from the guy who wrote a book called Future Shock, Alvin Toffler, and he he's of the view and he's a historian, he's, he's looking at it from the broader social science perspective. And he says that in fact we should be we should be teaching our children some science fiction stories because they can lead young minds through an imaginative exploration of the jungle of political, social, psychological and ethical issues that confront us today. So that's another value of science fiction. The journey continues, for example, in the case of Clark, there is now a center for the study of imagination on the campus of the University of California, San Diego. It was inaugurated a little over a year ago, in May last year. And if you go to the website, you can, you can find out some of the discussions. It's a very multidisciplinary Center, so they bring in neuroscientists, social scientists, uh, and, and IT specialists, artificial intelligence guys. Everybody comes, and then they have these interesting multidisciplinary discussions. We started with Vern, and we I want to end with him. And I think this was also mentioned in the opening. This is. I think what we come back to. Science is made of mistakes, so be never afraid to make mistakes. As long as we make, we will learn from the mistakes we made. And I managed to locate the particular amazing cover that inspired our poster. So, as you can see, I spent many pleasurable hours exploring Google images for amazing stories and other covers, and then I stumbled upon this. So the journey is highly recommended. I have only skimmed through some of the material that's available for free online. Please, please continue to explore at your own pleasure. So that's it. That's it, and we have time for a few questions and quick comments that we'll be happy to take in English or Sinhala. How are we for time? Okay, so we started at 11.30, we have about 10 minutes. Anyone? Prashna Tiyanwanam, Sinhala Unat Kamakne Ahan. in the audience, they are very young people. Besides Demon Ananda that we mentioned, can you think of anyone, anyone else who tried very affordable common man and common woman's fiction in this country? <laughs> 
He is the only one we could, uh, we could okay. come up with. And then he is also a very underrated, unsung kind of writer. Anyone else that, that you can think of? The, the comics are there, the Chitratatas are there, which kind of have a life of their own. At some points, the pulp fiction and comic fiction intersects, but they are also on their own tracks. But even the are not very mainstream. Not anymore. Yeah. There was a time. Yeah. There was a time in the 60s and 70s when it was highly popular. And uh, papers exclusively carrying comics came up, like Satuta and Sittara. But then in the 80s, it went down. I don't know whether there are any more Chitragata papers today. Are there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind I, think, of I think there is an association of comic artists. That's right. Yeah. Trying to revive yes. the, the old uh, favorite Amar story. I was talking to them recently about uh, starting a comic convention here. And ah, yeah. great if there is one. But I, I, I don't know how uh, serious they are about it. So. Yeah, the thing is, there is a whole book written by uh, Professor Sunilare Ratna which, which looks at the rise and decline of singular comics. Uh, I took some of the information uh, from his book. Basically, uh, he doesn't give a clear answer why Chitrakatas decline. He says it could be because of television, it could be because the, the publishers were too greedy and went into too many uh, poor substandard kind of stories and illustrations. Uh, it could be a number of reasons. He doesn't give a clear one single reason for the decline. And also, writers and illustrators didn't adapt. They didn't yeah. keep up with the changing, changing uh, environment and, and people's aspirations, I suppose. Well, also, I think parents are a bit reluctant to, you know. Parents are always reluctant. <laughs> yes. You know, I first read, my first Chitrakata, so all confiscated <laughs> by my teachers or by my parents. And the funny thing is, my parents were school teachers and they used to confiscate Chitragadas from kids in their school and used to bring it uh, home and keep it where they thought was safe from me. But I used to, I used to find it and read it. So all, well not all, most parents and teachers didn't like it at that time. I think that is a general problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. you can think they, but it doesn't matter. Same with, same with Deepanananda. They were banned in schools. Yes. Even on the stories were not allowed. Not allowed. Considered a very bad influence. I remember my parents used to talk about him and he was like, you know, really bad. <laughs> the thing is, he was okay. I mean, I mean there was no pornography. In no, 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 no. It's just that there was, you know, a lot of blood, <laughs> murder, and crime, and that sort of thing was there. A lot of James Bond reports. Yeah. I'm sure. I haven't read too many actually. I've only read a couple of them. Yeah, I haven't read all the 1,900 books, <laughs> <laughs> but then they were not tagging. You can't call them polar at all. Yeah. No, they no, were no. very clean <laughs> stories. I guess they were from a different time, so maybe people had different sensibilities back then, and maybe those people considered it to be pornographic. Not pornographic, I think. Uh, I don't know what our parents and teachers thought, but maybe they thought it will kind of contaminate yeah. These young minds. So you know, parents, all parents are very, very anxious about what could happen to their children. Now, as a parent, I also have that anxiety. So I suppose it was part of that. But as things go, Vimanan and the stories are pretty mild. Yeah, very much. But to compare to what is published today. Any any other questions? Any Chitrakata fans in the audience? Ah, what do What do you read? I read that Dandesi had an Ah, right, okay. And uh, all the new children that I read. And they actually had that uh, convention kind of thing. Oh, did you go? Uh, I didn't go, but okay. I heard of it. You heard about it? Uh, yeah. They had this exhibition of Chitra Yeah, yeah, it's an art gallery. Yeah, yeah. I, I missed that. Yeah, I missed yes. that. Right. So it was amazing actually. Right.
I mean, some guys are, I mean, simply amazing. I mean, take, uh, take uh, Camillus, who creates, created Gajaman and Sivikidis and so on. Now, he first started drawing these characters in 1966, right? The year I was born. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> he still does it. And a couple of years ago, I met him and I was so thrilled, you know, I took a photograph, uh, you know, the kind of uh, fan worship thing. I sat next to him, I talked to him and I took a photograph. You know, he's one of my heroes, Camillus. And he's now in his 70s, a uh, very modest, humble guy and he continues to write one of the finest pieces of satire in this country. I mean, see, it is weekly or daily, he pokes fun at all our uh, politicians and, and other worthies. No, Gajaman, I think, is not in any publication. But Sirvi, this is your paper, right? Yeah, yeah we have two friends from Rivira. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing <laughs> Camillus back to us. You know, he was not in a mainstream paper for a long time. And then now Rivira is publishing him. Daily, this. Is it daily? Is it a Sirvi's pocket cartoon? And Sunday, then the full thing. Yeah. I mean, so people like that. Uh, so there are some, some guys, comic artists uh, here, who have been drawing for 30, 40 years. Sirbilis uh, creator will be, you know, if he continues to be active, in a couple of years he would have drawn for 50 years. Remarkable. Any? Why don't we have our own writers, science fiction writers? That is for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have an now, for instance, now we do that. No, I mean, significant. Uh, I think it will come in time. I think there are good attempts. I, I should say there are good attempts. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the stories that uh, now offer to have is published there. But what was used to be published, and there are some, some very, you know, good stories. It may be that we, I don't know why. Maybe the media that is not giving them a chance right now. The only, 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 only outlet was this kind of science fiction story. Now they, they have to come. That we were used to carry. That we used to Right now they say no law. No law. No law. So it may be because the media doesn't give them an opportunity. And even, even people, even in English, now I know Karl Muller wrote uh, what he described as a science fiction uh, story. But those, the readers also haven't, so it's not just the writers not writing, but also the readers not buying. There's great difficulty selling these things, as you might have also found. You know, our market is not ready for this. I don't know whether it will ever be. I don't know. Yeah, so Karl Muller's others book sell, but this particular one hasn't done too well from what I heard. What's it called? It was... It has uh, some futuristic uh, one um, two thousand something year in the title. I, I can't immediately remember, but uh, it was a slim volume. Yeah, it came out about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, certainly not one of his known titles. Yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing. Should we wrap up? Okay. So thank you, everyone.